Welcome to Keeping Up With Data. Keeping Up With Data is the podcast that keeps data enthusiasts up to speed with what is happening in the data world. We bring in the leading minds from the data industry to talk all things career, news, embarrassing stories, failures and successes. So something really important for us here at Precision Sourcing is mental health. It's something we've been focused on a lot over the last year or so. And we're lucky enough to have partnered with the Black Dog Institute. And we're going to be doing a lot of events with them this year. A lot of our events, money will be going towards them. And they're out there aiming to create a mentally healthier world for everyone. So if you wish to support the cause, please donate via the link in the bio on this podcast. And you'll be seeing a lot more information about Black Dog over the next year. Here again for another episode of Keeping Up With Data. As always, Keeping Up With Data is for our community to keep everybody up with the latest trends, technologies, and what is happening in the market. So today we are blessed with the lovely presence of Malcolm Wonstall and Emily Noda. Um, so yeah, we've got a couple of interesting topics to discuss today. Um, Malcolm's VP of Data in Cochlear, but I'll let him do his own intros. But we're going to touch on data privacy. Um, obviously, a lot of people interested in that space right now. And next year is going to be a big, big, big uplift in that space, particularly with AI coming into the market. So... <laughs> Yeah, Malcolm, if you want to introduce yourself, tell us who you are. Yeah, for sure. About. Absolutely. Um, yeah, so uh, my name is uh, Mal Wonsall. I am Malcolm Wonsall usually when I'm in trouble. Mal Wonsall uh, <laughs> for most of the other times. Um, I am uh, pretty fresh into the role at uh, VP uh, of data at Cochlear, looking across the data strategy. So for those who don't know, from a data Cochlear, uh, from a Cochlear perspective, um, uh, the Cochlear implant, so basically bringing um, hearing back to those who can't hear anymore, which is a pretty pretty awesome mission to work towards um and and data obviously underpins the whole organization so my role there is to figure out what the path forward looks like over the next three five and 15 years from a from a data perspective so you know no big deal very simple <laughs> really easy to work out um but yeah my whole career has been in data i'm a data nerd through and through yeah we've uh, definitely got a lot to touch on on it so i suppose emily was there anything in particular you were interested in to I reckon you've been in like big businesses. Like obviously we talked yesterday, like banking is a massive one. You get quite siloed. There's yeah. a lot of you. So now going into Cochlear where it's a, not greenfield, but like somewhat greenfield where yeah. you've got to like condense everyone and make sure you're using data effectively. How has that change sort of felt for you? Oh, look, in all honesty, it's, um, there, there are parts of it that's wonderful. So I had a team that was around about 1,500 strong of, of engineers and, and analysts and data scientists and whatnot um, back at Westpac, which is my prior gig. Um, uh, love it. Brilliant. It was awesome to scale that big. Um, but you, you end up having to try and aggregate around about 1,500 people challenges into every day, which takes up about 99.9% .9 of the day. Um, so, so Cochlear has allowed me to get back to my passion, which is really actually trying to, um, figure out the, the art and science of data and how it can bring value to an organization. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a bit of a, bit of a one man band at the moment, starting to try and centralize data and build up the team again. So, uh, both are awesome. Uh, I think I, I enjoy, um, being in that kind of close knit community and being able to build things from the ground up. It's, it's always very gratifying. Can't wait to see how you take off because it's going to be a good big journey, but a good journey. Yeah. <laughs> big journey. It's yeah. always a big journey in data. It, it it always starts small and grows big. I mean, quite honestly, back at um, Westpac, the team there in that big data team that the, when I walked in, just going back about six years, had I think twenty to thirty people in it, and so it ended up with about fifteen hundred. So it grew wow. grew very quickly. If there's a, I don't know whether you guys would say too quickly, but it definitely grew yeah. very quickly. Yeah, yeah, that's pretty crazy. But I suppose kind of reeling it back into the start with data privacy. Obviously, mm -hmm. data privacy has been breaches left, right, and centre. I suppose in Australia, Medibank. You were with Medibank. So I was. Could touch I was, on that yes. if, if if allowed. Not during. That's all right. Yeah. So it was, it was <laughs> all happened because you left. Exactly right. Exactly <laughs> right. But uh, we tell sure there was nearly every company in. In Australia, 2022, we're like, yeah. well, we need to we need to lock down things. So how do you start from, okay, let's just say you've got a business and 100 people in it and you plan to scale up to 1,000. You don't know mm -hmm. when it's going to be, but you obviously, from the start, you need to have data privacy governance. You need to have things ruled out to avoid. Yeah, yeah, you really do. It's like this, uh, privacy is this weird thing. We, we uh, 
we kind of think of it as a binary, like we either have privacy or we don't, like our bedroom doors either closed or open. Um, and, and the reality is like for all of us, we haven't had privacy in, in years. Mm. Uh, probably for most of our lives, we haven't, like it's continually been a thing that's just been more and more um, invaded upon as data's grown and the methods of getting into data have grown. So most organizations now tend to um, tend to start to think about it when they move out of that small business mentality and they start to think about quantifying things like what would a data breach actually cost? What would it mean to our brand? What would it mean to um, our, our customer base? What would it mean to our products? Mm. Um, and that's when it starts to become real. Like people then start to think about, oh, okay, this is something that really needs to be front and center, not just as a nice to have, but it's a, it has the potential to do massive brand damage. Yeah. And we, we've seen that like over the last couple of years, you can kind of reel off the, the breaches. Mm. Um, and now, you know, Optus, poor Optus the other day, oh, God. Um, mm. you know, it kind of had the one-two punch, but it was all fresh in our minds from what, what a lot of us went through last year with that privacy breach situation. Yeah. Was Optus, was Optus a breach or was that an outage? Um, the recent one was an outage, but previously the, oh, it was yeah, a breach. Yeah. So the, the, the one of the one-two punch was a breach. Uh, and that was actually a great example. Like a lot of breaches are not, um, you know, uh, a, a, a very small lapses of judgment. And, and that was the case there where it was effectively, a you know, a, a development endpoint that um, was left open um, for some, for anyone to just go and query, but it had a bunch of production data in there. And this is like the thing. So small companies and, and even a lot of larger companies will say, well, it's really hard to create synthetic data to create um, false data that replicates production scenarios. Mm. Well, let's just use prod data and test. Yeah. It's a really easy thing to do. Yeah. And, and I guarantee you like every data engineer listening or watching will have done it <laughs> at least once. Just go, oh, that's the quickest thing to do. But these are now the repercussions that, that can happen with just that one little technical lapse in judgment. Yeah. How, how do you come back from something like that, like as big as Medi? Well, yeah. Obviously, you can't come back by helping your customers, but if X amount of people's data is out yeah. online for people to buy, how do yeah. you... You well, can't really come back or get it back. Like This is it. Like, it's it's a, it's a one of those Pandor, Pandora's box kind of situations mm. once, once your data's out there. And now there's now a lot of sites that, you know, you can go and... And search which breaches you've been involved in, and which and and what data is out there exposed. Um, a lot of these companies um, have kind of gone and sourced the data from, you know, quote unquote, the dark web, pulled it all together, and let you search it yeah. to see whether your um, whether your information's exposed. Um, once it's out there, it's out there. Um, I think the the cold comfort um, that many of us can take is that. Um, a lot of the, our data was voluntarily out there anyway. Yeah, mm -hmm. true. Um, if we think about what we've vo volunteered through all the services that we sign up for, through basically every single time we fill in a form mm -hmm. um, and every single time we click, I agree without reading and just click <laughs> free subscriptions to yeah. stand yeah. free subscriptions. 10% off, 10% off. <laughs> yeah. Next, next, next. So I think a lot of it's been volunteered away anyway, um, but it doesn't... Um, but how do you come back from that from an organizational perspective? You've got to rebuild trust. Like you've actually got to go out and prove that you can be a good custodian of people's data, that you don't treat it like a privilege. Mm. Um, and I think that's the switch that's happening nowadays. Like how do we get data to be um, truly owned by the people and that companies are effectively um, asking? Yeah, they're asking for consent mm. and using it only when given. Yeah. What do you think about the Optus opt to do 200 gigs of data to the, that has an end date, by the way, of yeah. 31st of December. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. After all the outages. Yeah. Like... On Telstra. In, uh, oh, I'm <laughs> Optus. So uh, I didn't learn the first time and, 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 and it's a little bit. Um, so, uh, and I know, I know a lot of people who work for Optus, um, and, and do a fabulous job behind the scenes, uh, from a PR perspective, I think it's, you know, hasn't been received super well. It's, um, yeah. data's, data's not a, um, not really commoditized very like we all don't no, we it was the last time you ran out yeah exactly so yeah. in terms of what they've offered I mean to me they've offered nothing because I think I have I don't know whether I have unlimited data but it feels unlimited I've never yeah used it. So, I think when I was with Optus they used to give you the option I think I had a crazy package where you could have whatever 200 as gigs of data yeah. as the package yeah. which I was t probably 20 gigs yeah. I was hitting yeah but they gave you the option to donate your data to or your oh, yeah your 4G 5G yeah. donate it to people who 
Yeah. Need so, it. so at the time, so I was on the receiving of that. So at the time, I was working at the Smith family, who were one of the non for profits who received that data. Oh, nice. Um, so that was an awesome idea as to where, um, you know, these these um, kind of bigger tech organizations can find an effective way of using data to give back. Because um, that, that's massive. Like if you go to disadvantaged youth, bit of a tangent, disadvantaged youth across Australia, one of the biggest disadvantages is that um, technical divide. Mm. So can't do their research for their homework, can't interact with their friends and family um, online because they don't have the equipment. And if yeah. they do have the equipment, they don't have the connection. So yeah, that was a, that was an, oh, maybe that's a suggestion. Yeah, yeah, Optus, if you're yeah. listening, you know, <laughs> throw it to charity instead of giving it back to yeah, people. That's so true. That is true. What not to do when you're trying to buy a value <laughs> <That's> customers <right. laughs> like, you know? Yeah. God. I think you touched on as well, Malcolm, the other day you put an article about, um, this shook me anyway, I think it was 89% of the states, or I might be wrong. With yeah, this. close. Yeah, 87%. So <laughs> so this is this, is this um, whole uh, re-identification um, uh underestimation by us we we think that if we just give little bits of our information away it's kind of it's okay you know it's really hard to google incognito we are <laughs> yeah yeah people yeah so it's done <laughs> fixed right um but yeah so the study and this is an old study right uh, Carnegie Mellon I think uh, uh 2000 the study was um across the U.S. census data so around about 250 million people um 87 percent of them were able to be individually identified with just their postcode their gender and their birthday. I mean, um, yeah. So if you think of like those three things, you'd be like, I don't care. Anyone can know yeah. those three things. They don't know me. And yet nine out of 10 people, they absolutely do know you just from those three pieces of information. And it goes to this thing like they, um, we feel strangely, we feel really attached to our names. Um, like our names are our identity. Um, and, and you're like, there's some stuff that we can figure out about names. Like names could probably tell me a bit about your demographics. Um, probably tell me in, in most cultures could tell me a bit about your background. If it was first name, last name, um, could probably guess your generation from your name. Outside of that, your name is like the least interesting thing about you from a data perspective. Yeah. Um, but, but I can guarantee you, if you go and start to look at your Google prof profile or your Apple profile, the, the things these companies have on you, which is like your name, but it, everything else about you just tied to an ID that is like way more, it, they know more about you than you probably know about yourself. Um, and that is when you think that you, they can understand exactly who you are from potentially three little bits of information, when they stitch together like thousands, hundreds of thousands of bits of information around you, and they know exactly that it's not a cohort, it's not 20 people. They know that it's you. Yeah. They follow you and they understand exactly what you do. This is where, this is what I say when I say privacy isn't binary. Like we've been giving it away for a while. We just, yeah. need, to, we need to figure out where that line is yeah. for each of this. And the myth of people listening to you on your phones, obviously not a thing. It's a, or is it? I'm sure. Yeah, yeah. So there's, this comes up all the time, right? The, the, is the microphone on? I'm a firm believer that they <laughs> yeah. definitely yeah. listen to yeah. So, so, and there's been like, you know, there's, there's, there's been a lot of research into people like actually ripping apart the phones and, and, and working <laughs> their way back and decompiling what's on the chips. Um, it's not that they couldn't, uh, yeah. it's not that they, that, that they're good corporate citizens and they couldn't just sneaky switch it on. The reality is in your phone, there's like a, there's a, um, uh, built into the hardware. If you say those keywords, so, you know, okay, Google or Hey Siri or, or Alexa or whatever it is, uh, whatever your flavor is that's the only time that it switches the microphone on. The reality is they don't need to. So like hearing what you say um, versus understanding everything that you do and you volunteer to your digital device, where you are, mm. all of your shopping, all of your um, uh, receipts and emails, uh, all of your photos, all of your notes, like everything, all of that you voluntarily signed away. So having to listen to you as you, you know, sing in the car, like <laughs> the least informative thing that they need to do. Yeah. They, they, they know you anyway. So when you get those weird things like your Instagram ads about cat food, when you, you know, you accidentally mentioned cat food in the car, there's something else about your trail that told them that you, you need. <laughs> sometimes I'm like, surely not. Yeah. It's like, sometimes I haven't even men mentioned it. At I all think the scary part it. is yeah. the, when you think about it and that's the bit yes. where like, that's where it gets a bit creepy because yeah. you can, like, sometimes I've thought about, like, random ass things, but, like, camping, for example, and yeah. I'm like, oh, I need to get some pitchforks yeah. or camping or I need to get X, Y, and Z. And then 
Exactly what you need. Just, when you just a random <laughs> example, like, and, and then I've got pitchforks on my Instagram feed. I'm like, huh? How does where, where does that come in? Yeah, well, see, this is the thing. So this whole, um, like, if you go down that personalization path, um, learning uh, people's behavior. So we are, we're, we're pretty easy to predict. Um, um, and especially when you have a mass of data that's actually looking across, you know, large populations um, that you're able to cohort really smally, um, the chances are you've exhibited a bunch of behaviors right before your pitchfork camping holiday um, <laughs> that other people who who take pitchforks to camping, all three of them, um, <laughs> have also exhibited right before before that decision point. So mm. it's it's almost like at aggregate, it's actually probably more nuanced than your own thinking. Like it's able to pick up on where you're going before you know you're going there. Mm -hmm. And that's why it feels creepy. That's why when you see it, you're like, oh man, how did it know that? Yeah. But there are a bunch of cues that you unconsciously or subconsciously give that at aggregate, because of the amount of information that's there, these algorithms are able to kind of pinpoint you personally. Yeah. And they start recommending you stuff because they know all of the things about around it rather yeah. than what the actual thing is. Yeah. yeah. So smart. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's a, it's a fascinating technology. It's like the more you go into it, the more you get into this mindset of at the one point you're like really scared and going, oh my gosh, this is, you know, mm. these corporations know everything about me. We're living in 1984. It's come true. It's, you know, the matrix or, what, or, uh, or you know, I robot, what's next? <laughs> and then there's a part of you that kind of goes, well, you know what? My life is incredibly convenienced by all of these things. Mm. Uh, and you actually see a lot of, um, you know, the younger generations, not to make us feel old, but the young, the kids nowadays, uh, they just embrace it. Um, mm -hmm. Like to the point of actually almost um, at kind of scoffing at the idea of that their privacy or their data is anything to to be protective about. Yeah. You saw when they tried to yeah. ban TikTok here um, because, you know, the conversation around banning TikTok here because of the involvement from, uh, from a Chinese government standpoint mm -hmm. um, over, over the corporations with ByteDance and so... Um, it was, um, yeah, like the backlash was huge. Mm. I actually think they would have been writing on the streets. And, um, <laughs> yeah, I think that's a whole different ball game altogether with like the advertisement for kids. I definitely agree with that. And there's that kind of twine into why kids now, not kids, but like under 15 year olds who have access to phones are almost so addicted to their phones because they're getting these prompts that are like, oh, I need to go there. And they just lead on a spiral to constantly yeah. search in the next thing that comes into the feed. Yeah, it's a... It's a, and this is where like data is totally in the realm now of, of should we not, could we? Because mm. the, the reality is we can't, like we yeah. can do lots. We can do lots of bad stuff if we wanted to. And you only have to look at, you know, where um, the advertising and the gambling industries have already taken us to know that it's not hard to influence people. There are studies that show how easy it is to radicalize human beings um, if given the right channel. So we know we can. It's now coming back. And this is where I think, you know, uh, legislation and, and, and um, regulation are kind of probably playing catch up because they've got to start thinking about the should we and, and setting like frameworks around what, how do we need to protect the world of tomorrow mm -hmm. from all of the can we's when we know we can. Why don't you think it's like the first port of call that's happened like before all of this is now blown up and it's kind of just like, oh shoot, we need to backtrack a little bit and do this. Like, why has that not been like a building block yeah, at the start? That's a good point. Yeah, it is it's a it's a good point. And and, and this is like I guess it's the it's the beauty and the and the danger of, of free innovative societies is that you're you're ultimately driven, especially in capitalist societies, you're ultimately driven by what makes your buck. Hmm. Um and you know, it's 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 more economically viable to manipulate people than it is to not manipulate them so mm. um so that tends to run to the forefront and then industries will try and self-regulate and they'll kind of self-regulate because they don't want the regulation to come in from the government because they know it'll be a bit more heavy-handed and then invariably uh, we're going to this ai trend right now right where mm. where governments and 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 corporates are all struggling with what the right balance is how do you um how do you make sure that the rules are there but also you don't want to stop innovation because if you stop innovation in australia or in the u.s other countries aren't going to stop they're going to push it harder and then do you lose your advantage 
as a in the global you know arms race of yeah. the, of IT yeah. and data and AI. So yeah, I think um, legislation and regulation is always lagging, um, but man, they've got a hard job. Yeah. There was the oh, whole yeah. thing where um, I'd seen it. I don't know what, when exactly it was, but I think it was this year where like Silicon Valley founders for startups, X, Y, and Z all had this petition where Jeff Bezos, yeah. Elon Musk all had signed to say, stop AI. Yeah. yeah. And then Elon Musk <laughs> jumps on and says, oh, I've got the next best chat GPT. Yeah. It's my thing. Yeah. Like, yeah. It's it's interesting. The the If you look at the people, look, there's a, there's a part of me that really wants to take that that altruistic lens and say they were signing it in good faith, but the... Yeah. Um, the people who all were, were kind of signing on to that were largely those who have led the industry and kind of taken their slice of the pie. Yeah, yeah manipulation at its finest. Hey, you know, everyone slow down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I think it, it, I think there's, there is some genuine concern. Um, you know, we're in uh, this, this whole Gen AI LLM craze over the last six to 12 months um, and no one knows where it's going to stop mm. has been genuinely interesting like fascinating to watch i don't think um we we've, we haven't seen a tech take off like this for some time um the real the the next um thing that everyone's watching is this whole um agi the artificial general intelligence the idea that you know not just that ai can't just mimic um uh based on a bunch of uh historically fed patterns like it's doing at the moment but it can actually um perform tasks that it hasn't seen before um you know equivalent to that effectively of a of the way that humans learn yeah and that that world's gonna catch us by surprise everyone like a few years ago was saying that's probably still 20 30 years away and now mm. a lot of people are saying that's maybe five ten years away there's some people that are saying maybe we're a little bit of the way there already mm. so it's yeah it's gonna be it's gonna be a very how does that get governed had, like if if you can't govern basic data from the start, yeah, it's, where does it come when AI? It's a, it's a weird world, right? Where if the more the more human these, you know, uh, algorithms that are effectively code writing code become, you know, we're all governed by laws, and those laws evolve. Um, if I go and if I go and write a piece of code, that code, um, I'm still governed by the laws, but that code isn't governed by the laws. Yeah. Um, and if it starts to operate a little bit autonomously, and we've seen heaps of examples where, you know, if, if you feed history into these algorithms, they replay the worst history of human beings. Like we're historically a bit racist. We're, like we do a lot of bad things as humans. And if you put all of that data in there, then the machines do the same thing. Yeah. Um, I think it was Amazon who did an early study onto in HR um, and fed in a bit too much data, and and their um, their preferred candidates were suddenly coming out as like white men all the time because they fed it a large enough amount of historical data that showed, well, you know, back in the day, yeah, this is uh, our persona, this is, this is what we hire. white men. So, wow. Yeah, it's it's an interesting world we're going into. Yeah. What about your plan then for like cochlear? Because obviously you're going to be pivotal to all of that. Well, not all of that, but most of that and the build, like yeah, yeah, it's it's an exciting time. I think um, this this world of um, being able to um, augment the human experience and and you know the parts of you know the fleshy parts of us that are a bit fallible. Um, I run a lot and my knees suck, so I know that I know the parts that are fallible. Um, we start to get augmented a little bit more and more. Uh, cochlear implants have been around for fifty years. But the way that they build into our environment is um, is developing really quickly. The way they're able to um, interface with our phones via Bluetooth and our TVs and, and um, the world around us, our computers, is developing really quickly. So I think that the world of tomorrow with those kind of devices is going to be much more about the, the connectedness and how that enhances people's lives. Um, and so this this data journey for cochlea is um, uh, really exciting. Like I'm coming along at the best time. This mm. organisation has has gone from strength to strength. They lead the industry, and now data is really uh, coming to the forefront in how we can shape this this medical technology of tomorrow. So I am a very very minor cog in this incredible wheel, but it's a privilege to to lead that data strategy throughout the the next. Um, yeah, you know, the next couple of years. Definitely, definitely a very, very good time with everything that's been going on. And yeah, 
the last while for sure um what was i going to say that i was going to touch on something funny yes we talked about elon musk and i'd seen yes. elon musk has put a petition out to find the first person who's willing to put his brain chip into the brain uh, what what's that and mm. will cochlear be purchasing some <laughs> well um i think if i think for ev- whoever's signing up from that should look at the um uh, the monkey participants that they've used so far, who I don't think have fared too well. Um, I think there's quite a few, quite a few ethicists who um, are slightly concerned at the amount of um, at the amount of primate waste that's come out of that program. Um, so yeah, Planet of the Apes 2.0, watch out. Um, but uh, but yeah, look, I think the the augmented like Elon Musk aside, because um, we don't want to go there. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, but the 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 augmentation of humans with data um is a really like uh, that's where we're going mm. if you think about today like i know i've got my heart rate tracked right now all of my steps my gps have been tracked i got here you know um uh, via uber that, that mm. told me how to get here and the time to arrive um, knows where i've got to be next and it'll tell me when i need to leave <laughs> so all of the i think we're already very augmented with data um at the next barrier for us is that kind of fleshy digital barrier um which is already getting pretty iffy like you watch most people walking around the street and will have um earbuds in Mm. all the time so they'll have a conversation with you whilst they could potentially getting be having a conversation through their device or or be getting translations or other information fed to them um that's not a very convenient technology because you've got to take it out it runs out of batteries it's kind of stuffy in your ear Will that get further integrated? Will the world of, you know, these devices that already connect to our brain through our ears or through our mouth or through our eyes, will they just get closer and closer? Probably. That's the way they're going. And I think if you look at what we're becoming comfortable with, um, it's just like that body augmentation is becoming a bit more normal. Um, And I think, you know, without trying to get all robot on us it, it's going to be a it's going to be a very different world in in 10 20 years time than it is today which is normal you look at 20 years ago yeah and if you'd said where we'd be today you people would have laughed like yeah. it would have been science fiction we need to have holograms in that or <laughs> yeah, yeah like flying yeah. cars so yeah. Yeah. <laughs> flying cars are on the way i've seen well, so we don't get into well, them yeah. <laughs> that's a different yeah. topic altogether or yeah, yeah and that's but i did see some things like when when you see like futurology kind of conversations and there was a lot of um like we, we may not although we're getting close to holograms i'll tell you what some of the 3d technology and augmented reality is getting there but this idea um that we would be having conversations with people all around the world in one virtual room at the same time is now day-to-day for yeah. us like you don't think twice about having a phone call a visual phone call with someone from the other side of the world in different time zones and just interacting like you're face to face um even five years ago, that probably would have seemed like, oh, yeah, that's something that you do on occasions, but won't be day to day. And that's normal. It's normal to roll out of bed, <laughs> whack on the, f- uh, on, the, on the computer and you're face to face with someone yes. who's over the other side of the world. You do, yes. One that came out recently, the, the VR headset where you can on off pretend to be someone in a yeah. reality world. And it's like, yeah, it's cool to do that. But then you've got people who are actually just going to sit on them all day in their virtual well, this is um. Uh, so I, uh, Hollywood seems to be uh, like getting a lot of things right uh, in retrospect. Um, I think it's that uh, 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 Wall-E movie that uh, oh, yeah. paints humans as rather large, sitting in their um. I think they were hovering their hover seats and just plugged into plugged into augmented reality all the time. And um, again, if you look at the change between childhoods twenty years ago and childhoods nowadays, um, mm-hmm. in terms of what was digital. Um, and what were digital, in, digital interactions with friends and how they related in 20 years ago where everyone mm. was kind of out on bikes and it was all face-to-face interactions. I think the world, even though I think face the Facebook to Meta um, move was probably a bit presumptuous and, and I think um, Zuck himself will probably be saying it was maybe a little bit too early, um, that whole Metaverse concept, it's kind of been poisoned now, but the, the idea that we will live in a very augmented digital world and want to spend a lot of time there because it's preferable to the the real world. I don't really get it. Way. I don't get it though. Like I don't want to live in a digital virtual world. Like I also I like 
probably don't really understand the metaverse very well either. So like, I don't want to understand it either. Yeah. It's not, the thing is right now it's, it's like crap. Um, yeah. So, so if it's not good, it, it, it's not a good experience, yeah. but if it was, um, if we weren't physically here, but it felt like this, mm. um, there's, there's no, like the idea is that the worlds come together and yeah. they meld. And, and when it gets to that point, when the experience is close enough to that, there's probably not much, uh, no reason to not desire it mm. because look, getting people back to the office post COVID, um, has been a really hard slog yeah. because they got staying at the convenience of waking up, staying in your home. Don't worry about a shower. Just put a filter on the screen. that makes you look better than you are. <laughs> Like all of those things yeah. became really enticing. I yeah. reckon that's step one in the world towards as soon as the digital world becomes more enticing than the real world. And, you know, there's some stuff about the real world that's not so great. So maybe it's yeah. not that far away. Um, yeah, look, it's it's probably, we're probably the, the wrong generation for it. Mm. But um, I don't think it's many generations ahead yeah. um, where where they'll be facing into that mix between what is the right amount of time to spend in the digital world and not? Yeah, it'll probably be, yeah, like you say, be a bitter experience. I feel like the conversations will be so weird and different at that stage in life. Like, who did you pretend to be today? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, if you think of it, like there's already, I mean, people have literally died from starvation because they were playing World of Warcraft for too long. Yeah, so, like, there's already people too. who live in a digital world literally until their their, their physical world withers and dies. So I think, you know, the pre the precedence, not a good precedent, but the precedent is yeah. there. It's yeah. just how we, um, how we walk that line. And, and, and when we decide as humans that, that the, we've got the mix wrong and try and fix it up. And it comes down to back to that privacy thing, right? I think mm. that's also where we're grappling with the, um, where's the line, where's the right, right line between, oh, I've given too much away and I want that back, but it's too late. Yeah. Um, versus. I'm really convenienced by these things and I couldn't give up Google, Facebook, um, Apple, Amazon, whatever. So we're selling your data yeah. and who are clearly evidentially strong developers, coders. Yes. On the data company, they can hack you data. They can do all of this stuff. Yeah. What's happening? Those guys who can do things illegally as it is right now. We yeah. Them extraordinary wit AI as well yeah it's a mm. i mean the 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 bad guys online you know are, are often effectively and, and they're painted as as bad. look they are they're doing illegal things but they're effectively bad against organizations they're trying to many they're not trying to manipulate individuals largely there's obviously a bunch of scam bases that are but mm. the 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 data breaches they're not trying to get money out of individuals they're largely trying to get money out of organizations yeah. because they're the big bickies um i think the the ones that we need to regulate more are around um, both the large organizations and the governments that have um, infinitely more resources than than these you know small nefarious actors um, and can do the same things mm. um, but can put a much better PR spin on it. And I think that's where it's incumbent on us, like all of us in the data industry to try and figure out that framework of the you know those kind of ethical frameworks of the when should we be doing something when should we be putting our hands up and going this doesn't feel right um mm. this could actually be at to the detriment of society mm. it's a really hard big question to grapple and i don't know um whether anyone's really got it right yet i've been pretty much right it's it's yeah. it's every day there's a new technology that comes out and you think Wow, do I do I want to be a part like this impresses me, but is it like impressing me in a scary way or a happy way? Yeah. And it's it's hard to know. It's genuinely it's, hard. I'm to picturing know. like they need like a big almost like sector seven on Transformers <laughs> or like, you know, like yeah. for data and it needs to be like that intense to be like governing it. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I'm just picturing that movie Get Smart where they like <laughs> sit around the table and they need like weekly meetings around like all these breaches. I mean, if we're learning anything, it's that Hollywood has the answers, right? They've laid the, the laid, put yeah, out yeah, the blueprint yeah. for us. We just need to follow it. Yeah. I think, yeah, it, there's definitely going to be, and, and look, there's a lot of conversations going on at, at state and federal level in government mm. right now trying to grapple with data and um, 
and AI and, and what we do and, and, you know, groups set up like data 61 with CSIRO that are really trying to figure it out from mm -hmm. a, um, a, a public, um, private partnership, how we, how we do this, right. Mm -hmm. It's just moving so fast. And yeah. this is where like governments have struggled in a, for a long time with technology. It moves so fast that you're never going to be in front of it. You're always going to be running behind it. Mm. And it's very hard to put those advisory boards in place where everyone's a genuine actor and don't have a bunch of self-interest, including the government mm. parties. So it's, it's, it's going to be a careful world that we navigate. I think the best thing for the world would be um, the continual education of, of, of data with the kind of kids and adults of tomorrow. Mm. It needs to be a skill set that they understand because I think still today, a lot of people are giving things away that they have no understanding of yeah. and that they will come to regret in many years time. Mm. Skill, for example. Yeah. The target your history. Yep. Basic, basic, basic things in math. Mm. Yeah. 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 The risks of you Absolutely. It's and and digital literacy comes by default nowadays. Yeah. Like kids just learn it. And and the the like it, it would be scary to be on the other side of that and watching a child grow up and grapple with all of these things because it is so it's it's a bit of a cowboy world out there still from a mm -hmm. digital perspective. And um, yeah, so I, th I think education is the key. It's it's going to be. I don't think we can wait for as much as I'd like to say we could. I don't think we can wait for legislation and regulation to no. to help all of us. Um, and that's why I think it is incumbent on all of us data people to try and be um, good citizens and try and look out for the world because I think we're in a very unique situation mm. um, where we can really kind of shape uh, what happens next. For the better or the worse, yeah. Um, and and it's a it's a very privileged position to be in, but it's also kind of daunting because if we stuff it up, you know, maybe the matrix is what's next, and the robots take over. Maybe that's for the best. Who yeah. Knows? What would you say, like, because you're going to start hiring into your team, obviously, when you figure out your roadmap. Yeah. Like, if you let's just say you're in a position where you've got this team, they're like a mixture of analysts, governance, BI, reporting, insights, engineering analytics, data science, whatever, yep. the whole picture, what would you drill into them? Like maybe your top three things that are from like an AI sort of data privacy governance perspective. Mm -hmm. So I think number one is um, that, and look, most data people already know this, mm. um, which is never stop learning. Mm. Like you have to reinvent yourself yearly yeah, because everything is moving so fast. So if it's if the industry is something, if that's something that scares you, um, then I would probably stay away from data at the moment because mm. it's just not going to slow down for the next probably decade, maybe more, who knows? Um, yeah, so I think the never stop learning would be number one. Um, two is is be prepared to be a generalist. Um, mm. There was this time where data, it was a real kind of depth subject and you'd have your technology experts and um, your very specific experts in um, you know streaming data or batch ingestion or, or ETL or mm. um, you know um, some of the uh, data visualization more and more those you know very corporate speak those t-shaped skills mm. um, that being a professional generalist is just who you need to be in data because you're going to need to go and tell the story you're going to need to be able to understand the the business context of what you're dealing with, you're then going to need to be able to go and dive into the code um, and try and understand how it all fits together. You're kind of like the glue of the organization. Mm -hmm. So I would I would strongly say um, be and embrace being a professional generalist. Mm -hmm. um, third part would be, um, I think, just to uh, strap yourself in because change <laughs> is um, going at a crazy pace at the moment. It's exhausting. Uh, like there are times when I sit back and I'm just kind of take a breath yeah, and then I get back on the treadmill and keep going again. But um, yeah, so it, it just kind of strap yourself in. It's a super exciting time, super privileged to be working in this industry. There are mm. many who would have loved to 
have lucked into the industry when folks like myself did by pure fluke. Um, so uh, it, it is a privilege, but you need to be ready for the grind because it is um, it is hard work. Yeah, I feel like that generalist thing lands well, eh? Like we get a lot of requirements where everyone's like, oh, you know, they, they wear multiple hats <laughs> yeah, and yeah, like yeah. we're going to do this, but maybe 25% yeah. of the role is actually this, but like it's a, probably a really good thing for your career right? yeah, if it, you're in that. I, I've actually, the amount of times I've kind of had these coaching conversations where I say you need to, that generalism is something, it used to be something that you were scared of because you're like, oh, I'm not good at anything. Mm. Um, but now, especially in data, you are expected to be good at everything, even if that means you have a specialty mm. and that you're awesome at one thing, yeah. but that you can get by on everything else. You need to kind of understand that full gambit because there's no role where you can be hidden from it anymore. Mm. There, there are very few. There are very few where you can just be a data engineer mm. and just do pipelines and not have to understand yeah. any of the requirements mm. and just kind of pump it out. Um, even in the big organ, like if you look at where where um, Google, uh, Google Alphabet and and um, you know Amazon are going, mm. there's a lot more generalist people there. They're yeah. hiring a lot broader skills. So yeah, I think embracing that is the best thing you can do for your career. Yeah, I struggled for a long time thinking like, what am I good at? Yeah. The second you said, "Are you generalist?" I'm like. Yeah, yeah, shush, shush. Yeah, me, I was in my in my areas. Yes. Um, yeah. You not ten million fonts more than I'll ever know about the you have to do. How does someone be a generous when they're like right now the market is data engineers, AI, and they have that's the big focus for people. How does mm. be a generous for that way? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good point. And so and and that's it doesn't mean don't have a specialization. So your specialization is your kind of secret source. It's what sets you apart from the fifty other people who are who are going to that role. Um, but the, that general, like it, it's just not staying in your lane. And I think that's, uh, in, in that data world, you're expected to not stay in your lane. Mm. So even if you're, so MLOps, right, this, this like absolutely like total wizardry, um, that you need to be, you need to know very specific things to be able to do. Um, but if you don't understand how that ML tool chain is going to enable, um, the business change because ultimately that ML use case is going to need to require a return on investment. Mm. And if you don't understand that broader context and if you can't go and have that business conversation with those people so you understand it, nine times out of 10, you're going to deliver something that is technically awesome and totally misses the mark. And that's what moves you from being like a rock star that everyone loves and says, this is the guy, go and speak to this person versus um, someone who is exceptionally technically brilliant but doesn't land all of those awesome things that people talk about. Yeah. I mean, I was like, keep looking. Totally. It's, and it's just an awareness. You don't have to be real. And look, I get it. I'm a data person, total introvert. You know, if I could just stay in my, my room in the dark 24 seven, I probably would. <laughs> um, but, but it's about, you know, brushing up on those other skills enough so you can be broad enough to, um, just to have those interactions apart from anything else, but from a data perspective, no one knows what we do. Like no one gets it. Yeah. Like it doesn't matter who I meet. If they're outside the industry, they'll, you know, go, Oh, what about this data mesh? Let's talk about that. They don't have any clue what they're talking about. Yeah. So they just go uh, straight to AI. Yeah, oh yep, yeah. AI. Yeah. <laughs> Chat GPT. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it, it's, it's, that's right. It is everything. Yeah. So it's incumbent on us to be able to bridge that gap and learn to speak other people's languages so they can help value us the way we need to be valued. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's good little nugget there. Yeah, absolutely. What about last, I reckon, final roundup? Just a little bit of a sell on yourself and your team. Like you're going to be building it out. Cochlear, your team, well, you as a person. Why me as a person speaks for itself. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, uh, let, me, let, me, let me start with Cochlear. Avid runner. Like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Uh, let me let me start with cochlea. Um, so there is um, one sense in the world um, that can be completely absent mm. and can be brought back by technology, and that is hearing, and that is through cochlea implants. And there was one company that pioneered that, and that's cochlea. It is one of the very few companies that is Australia based and a global leader. You can't say that to many companies, um, and so it's 
it's an amazing privilege for me to be able to work there. Not only do you get to kind of wake up and when it's a bit of a dodgy day, you go, all right, um, my company is restoring hearing to people who couldn't hear yesterday, people who couldn't talk to their daughter, their grandmother, their son, had never heard their mother's voice before, can now do it today and they couldn't yesterday. Mm. So that is a pretty good... Sold. Th- yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> like, who wouldn't sign up to that? Um, look, going beyond that, the, the future of, of not only cochlear, but, but um, all in this med tech industry is around data. Mm. Um, it's, it's leading the... It, it gives us a chance to lead the way. Data used to be in the background. I started in the data warehousing days where you were kind of the reporting people and you were a bit af- a bit of an afterthought and you were kind of the you know the kicking person in the corner when everything <laughs> when everything didn't go right um data's leading the way we, we have a seat at the front of the table now um and and from my perspective um that's what i bring to an organization and for those who have worked with me before they'll know that 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 my deal is about um making sure that people not only recognize the value of data but that i help people um uh, sell the value in themselves um, because a lot of data people aren't awesome about self-promotion. Mm. Yeah. And the reality is data's running the world. Like if there should be anyone who's able to go out and toot their own horn, it's people who work in this industry. So, mm. um, you know, I am super proud to say that that um, people who have who have come out of university and, and worked for me in, in graduate programs are now... Um, working for Google, working for Canva, um, uh, working for for um, uh, Atlassian, um, and that makes me super proud. It makes me super proud when they leave to go to those places. And so I think for me, um, and those who have worked with me always understand that that it's about um, making the most out of you as a data individual. So if you're not sold by the cochlear message of being like you know the the, the most impactful um, organization in the country, if not the world. Um, then, then come and work for me um, because because I can set you up on the path for success. And I love people who just love what they do. Mm. That's what it's about for me. It's just mm-hmm. like if you don't come to work and enjoy what you do, then do something else. Because there's yeah. in the data industry, um, there's a heap of things to come to work and be excited about. Mm. And there's a grind every day, but um, yeah, I love it, and I love working with people that love it. And that's what we're going to build at Cochlear over the coming years. We. Exciting. Well, we'll wrap it up there, I reckon. Yes. It's a great chat. I'm sure everyone is going to be very interested in... You're going to be hit up in your DMs. Oh, look, totally. Yeah. Absolutely hit me up. Throw them all at me. <laughs> yeah. And obviously go through Precision Sourcing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for listening. We will be back. Thank you.